I'm Jay Horton. I make movies that make money. And this is Filmmakers On. Today, I'm talking to a fantastic writer and director of independent horror films, Lou Simon. Check out some of her past work. Um, I especially recommend three. And keep an eye out for 73 Minutes. Uh, she talks a little bit more about this in the interview, and it should be coming out fairly soon. Um, it sounds incredible. Um, I just want to make clear that with in all of these interviews that the guest views don't necessarily reflect my own. Let's do the interview thing. You've been working in the indie film scene for what, about a decade now? Oh God, yes. I just realized that it's exactly 10 years today. <laughs> or not today, but like this year. So wow. I guess by July of this year, it'll be 10 years. So do you think the future of uh, indie film, do you think it looks bright or bleak? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, it's tough, man. It's really tough. I mean, it's 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 a wonderful thing as a, as a consumer to be able to have so much free entertainment with just mm. one simple $10 a month. Um subscription it's great for the consumer for the filmmakers it's terrible because you know when you're streaming hours and hours of content and getting paid pennies on that on those hours you know how you're supposed to make money um and if you go through a distributor you get a percentage of those pennies as opposed to <laughs> the full penny so really i mean how much can you possibly make no matter how big their their membership is so that it's being streamed you know thousands hundreds of thousands of hours even million i mean i i haven't actually looked at uh, numbers so i don't know what the numbers are but um you're still getting such a, a small percentage of what they're getting it's tough it's really really tough it's it's day and night from when i started you know from my the first film I got distribution that did so well. And I was like, oh, this is so easy. I can just, just make one every year and we'll make all this money. To now, it's, it's tough. So speaking of your first movie, that was uh, Hazmat, correct? Yeah, that's the first one I got distribution. It's the first one that my company did. It's been our most successful movie to this day. Um, it did. Uh, it was back when DVD still existed. <laughs> yeah. it sold so it, it went into red box and just the sale from red box made us a very nice uh little sum there so um because they they bought like thirty five thousand copies or something like that and uh, oh wow yeah so you know even though we had a, we had a sales agent and we had um we had a you know distributor it 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 was a really nice paycheck for us and i thought oh i can do this you know, every year I can just write, do another, you know, low budget film and, and it's going to do really well and, you know, net us some money and it'll be great. But right around that time, the market changed. Like, I haven't talked to him again, but he's my distributor at that time told me that we were like the last in the sale that he had to Redbox. And after that, it oh, was wow. really, really hard to sell again. Yeah. yeah. What what year did that come out again? It came out in 2014. Right. That's yep. That's about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mm -hmm. I worked for a company between like 2010 and I right about I think 2014 was the last year. And I, I probably directed I don't know 10 movies for them and all traditional distribution stuff. And yeah, they they were they were cleaning up back then. Yeah. I mean, we were. I mean, I don't. I mean, I didn't go buy a house or anything, but you know, it was. It was. It was so that we could continue making them. You know. Yeah. We could keep reinvesting, and I had at, at the time I was very lucky to have my investors were all people I knew personally, and they weren't really looking to do it for money. So mm -hmm. they were all like, "Oh, you know, just put it back into the next project." You know, and, and we believe in you. We want to see you succeed, and I and we think you're going to be a huge one day because you're so talented, and we love you. So none of them were looking to make money. So it was just getting reinvested. I had flipped properties back in, in, in 2000 around the um, not 2000, but like the what do you call the first decade of the 2000s? Um, Was that the millennia? Yeah, I guess, uh, I you guess. know, <laughs> when, when the real estate market was really good. So at that time, mm -hmm. I was buying house, flipping it, and then investing the, re the investments into the next, you know, into another project or another two projects, you know. 
And I thought I'd use the same strategy with this, um, where I would keep reinvesting the profits and make, you know, larger budgets, you know, better films. Mm -hmm. Slowly build up. But the market's not the same. So, you know, just yeah. like the market crash in, you know, real estate, this this was a um, big crash in this one as well, because it just changed completely. You know, Blockbuster went out of business. Uh, even, oh God, even probably video went out of business now. So, I mean. I know, I just read that. It's so sad. That was, uh, that was the only, that was the last uh, DVD sale that I ever did was a uh, family video. Despite, I think, in my, in my opinion, in my own work, Mm -hmm. the work getting better the the returns have been lower you know how many times can you do that you're like mm, you know i'm not going to keep doing this and i and i this is not going to be one of those podcasts where i'm like trying to like cheer everybody up like yeah everything's great you know go and make a movie i am not that person i'm the person who's like really think about it i mean unless you can do it really really cheap um so you're doing it for the fun of making it you have no expectations of making money off of it then don't do it like and i mean it depends i guess on how ethical you are and how much you want to tell your investors about how much of a crapshoot it is anytime i'm talking to an investor i'm always like be be ready don't invest anything you can't lose like this is yeah. way less than a 50 percent chance of making a profit on it yeah, way less especially if you my averages i mean i might have a, a little bit better average but just in general although i've man i've i've lost on on bigger on my bigger movies i've lost you know more than i'd like to say my my bigger movie or the movie that i had the biggest hopes for was a Phobia because they had tony todd oh, yeah. set cassie scrubble from the um from the shark native movies and mm -hmm. we were very hopeful. We it was actually right after Hazmat, so it was still within a window that it could have had, you know, the potential of getting into Redbox and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I swear to God, that movie was cursed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it really was because the things that happened are like, oh my god! First during production, just, just all kinds of issues. We had signed with a distributor, and there. I, I did my homework. I checked with all the distributors, with everybody who had worked with them, and everybody said, you know, they're they're decent. They pay, uh, that kind of thing. I don't know exactly what happened to the day, but I I think we just were very unlucky, and we got in at a point where they were going through a transition of employees, and just stuff kept getting dropped, and you know, I would I would. You know, I want to be a nice person, but sometimes you got to, when you're a producer, you have to be an asshole or a bitch. And, you know, I'd be like, hey, you know, what's the date of the release? You know, we, you know, you know, where can I speak to PR person, this and that. And I had gotten very used to a certain service with Hazmat, so I expected something similar. Um, and so when it wasn't happening, I was, you know, saying, you know what, this isn't going to work out. Let's just, let's just forget about this whole thing. So they let us out of the contract. And as we're looking for a new distributor, it got released anyway. Uh, uh, you mean they, they released it anyway? Yeah, they didn't, it didn't somehow go down the chain of, you know, they had, yeah. they had set up for, for a distribution with, the, with another company. Tuesday, I don't know what happened, but right. somehow there was a miscommunication between the two companies and, and the second company released it anyway. And so it was up on Amazon, uh, on everything you can possibly imagine. And mm -hmm. so I'm at, I'm at AFM and I go up to another to a distributor and I'm like, oh, I have this film, blah, blah, blah. And and he's and I show him like the little flyer and he's like, oh, this this just got released. I just saw it on Tuesday. I was like, no, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> you have to be wrong. There's no, there's no way. And he's like, yeah. And he looks it up on his phone and he goes to me. And I was like, <gasps> oh. oh my God. Okay. So. And so at that point you're not even doing promotion for it or right. nothing. Cause you, you had no clue. Yeah. Nothing. So I, you know, so I contact them and it took them like three days to take them down from all the different platforms. But by that point, it had been copied. It had been put on every, you know, touring site that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. A freaking nightmare. 
Um, and so, of course, then no other new distributor wanted to touch it because, you know, we're already, you know, pirated. Tainted. Everywhere. Yeah. And so we ended up to trying to work it out with them. We ended up having to sue mm. four years in litigation. Wow. <laughs> Lots of attorney's fees. Four years in litigation. Um, During the four years, was it? Were you able to still re-release it somewhere? Or was it held up that entire? It was time? held up that entire time. Even though it, my hope at that point was because I knew that if I self-release at that point, it wasn't going to make any money. So right. I thought, well, I'm I'm hoping that if I get this lawsuit settled, that some other distributor will make money, will pick it up, and we'll be able to make some money. Um, mm -hmm. But. It just, it, you know, nobody wanted to touch it. You know, they, they, they gave us offers, but the moment we were like, but, you know, our attorney was like, you have to, you have to disclose what happened because otherwise, you know, you don't want them to come back and say that you misled them. So the moment we would be like, but you should know that it was already released and it's already in torrent sites. And then it'd be like, okay, never mind. There's just too much content out there to take a risk on a, you know, on an indie film. Um, yeah with that yeah, kind of uh, history and so i mean it was it's it was four years and um thank god we settled otherwise it would have been another four years um we settled and um got i mean i had technically had the, the rights of the movie back by that point they never like countered saying that they had rights to the to, to um to release it their whole argument was the amount of damages not right. not the actual whether there was a violation of the copyright or not you know it's great to have a copyright because it gives you a registered copyright because it gives you so much protection but at the same mm -hmm. time you're very limiting as well because the the statute itself limits your your damages i was not aware of that it says it, it allows you if you can prove damages that are higher mm -hmm. Um, that you can get more, but how do you prove that in an indie film? You know? Right. It's really hard. I mean, how can we possibly say that it would have made a million dollars or something when we have no, no way of proving that? So it has three tiers. The first tier is, is like an innocent, um, innocent release, at mm -hmm. which point you're limited to like seven hundred and something dollars. You, did you say seven hundred? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, and then <laughs> uh, a purposeful release, and that's limited. I want to say, crap, it's been a while since I looked at the statute, but I think it's it's either, I think it's thirty thousand dollars, which is still nothing. I mean, how many yeah. films? You know, if you made a film for three hundred thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars doesn't even begin to compensate. And so to get to the maximum, which is 150,000, you have to prove that it was like, uh, like wanton, you know, negligence. So, or, you know, like, like it was done purposely to hurt you. I don't even know what the standard, like what it would take for you to prove that. So, and, and you're limited to one time, even though it was ended up being released three times, you're limited to one time per copyright. So that's it. You're limited to 150, even though your budget is higher than that. So we were argue, we were making a kind of legal docu arguments about the fact that it was that each release should be a different violation, and we were saying, and there were several companies involved because we had the original distributor, the distributor that that um, it was assigned to, and then we actually um, sued <laughs> the actual um, the actual websites. So Amazon oh, wow. and Microsoft, we, <laughs> we sued the big companies. <laughs> Dang, you went after it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm an attorney, so I'm like not going to just take sh lying down. Sorry, can I curse? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're going to go. And everybody was like, you're crazy. You're going after like the biggest companies in the world. And I was like, I know. But, you know, mm. you know, that's why all these distributor when you you know when you put up stuff on on these websites you mm. have to you have to indemnify them so it means that 
they never set foot on an accord. You know, they they have the the distributors were the ones who had to provide attorneys for them. So it was really not, no big deal to go after these companies. It was a long battle. I mean, litigation is is takes a long time, especially in federal court. It just drags along. So it was four long years. So I didn't get my I didn't get the whole thing settled until November of two thousand. 19 and then on, honestly it's it's been me who dragged her feet like just 2020 was just such a difficult year well um where does it where does it stand now has it been re-released are you with another distributor um it's been released everywhere in the world except the united states it's really funny um right so had a couple offers for distribution, but by the time that you, you know, you came up with the, um, the funds for the, um, errors and omission and all that, which normally would not scare me if this was an original release, because I would, I would, I'd be okay. Like, I'm like, okay, for sure, you know, down the pipe, we'll get, we'll get the money back. But because it's an old title and because we're not going to get that big push of a original release, I was like, eh. So uh, I've actually doing self distribution for the first time. I've never done that before, so I'm a little scared. So have you have you is it have you done it yet, or you're in the midst of putting it up? It's been su- yeah, it's been submitted. How how are you how are you doing it? Just Amazon um, and the then Prime Video Direct. Yeah, and then doing um, Film Buff for um, is it Film Buff? Film hub. Um, yes. Um, yeah. For the other little things. Um, I don't know. I'm not very hopeful at this time, but you know, we, the investors were paid from the settlement. So I, I have a lot of less, yeah. less pressure on me now. Right. I mean, at least, at least it's out. I mean, you know, the rates I've seen them all over the place, but you know, you, you might, you might see a few thousand a month, at least, you know, for a few. I don't know about that, but you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it'll be, whatever at this point it's, I, we did get, um, which I don't, I don't, do you know about horror pack? Horror pack. Um, I, I, it sounds familiar. They, they, do they, they package together horror movies, like, uh, five or six titles a piece. Is that what? I think it's three. Yeah. It's a mail subscription and they, they send out Blu-rays or and DVDs, I think, um, oh, okay. to their, uh, subscribers, uh, three a month, I think. And, um, so we did do, um, what to say August, August or September. Jeez. This day is so weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> August release with them. So, you know, that gave us some, a little bit of money so that we could hopefully do some advertising for, for the release. Once I actually have a release date from Amazon. For subsequent movies then, um, we'll see what you've directed, uh, four, four or five features now. Uh, or is it more? No, six. Six. Okay, I'm sorry. Six, I was just six. I was looking at today. I must have got confused. <laughs> um, so what did you do for distribution on the subsequent ones? On the other ones, I went back to the original um, distributor from from Hazmat, which is Uncorked. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have three of my films, but you know, definitely sales are down. You know, we're there's no big sale to Redbox, no big sale to mm-hmm. Family Video. Well, that's not true. All Girls Weekend did have a sale to um, Family Video, but it, you know, made still not. It's not thirty five thousand copies. All, All Girls Weekend was uh, where I think I became uh, aware of you because I, I I recognized. Uh, some of the elements of the one sheet, like I, I, I uh, the same artist must have done the one sheet for a movie that I released through uh, Green Apple called uh, Hitchhiker Massacre. <laughs> I had uh, produced it. I just I recognized the model and the the hair. Yeah, that was that's okay. that's my only issue with Uncorked. I mean, I, I love them; they're great. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Keep Leopard is is probably one of the only honest distributors out there, and for her he is definitely the best. I mean, mm-hmm. he's definitely branching out now. I can see that they're picking up, you know, documentaries now. They're picking up um, the 
picked up a bunch of Christmas movies, which I thought was hilarious. Mm-hmm. You know, just because everybody eventually is like, oh, great, we'll go homework. <laughs> <laughs> if I was your typical woman and just like to do homework movies, I'd be, I'd be golden. But, um, but I, I, I wasn't crazy about that, about the artwork for either one mm-hmm. of those last two releases. I thought the artwork for Hazmat was amazing, was really good. And, yeah. I, you know, I, I actually still to this day make money on Hazmat. You know, every three months I get a paycheck. That's great. Um, I do the other ones as well, but um, but not, you know, not the same. Like the artwork, I just don't think so. I don't want to do movies. Um, yeah. All Goes Weekend is, you know, very much not a typical horror film and Mm -hmm. it doesn't have um you know um, as a female filmmaker i just i don't really believe in female nudity and stuff like that it's not that's not what i'm after and the artwork is a girl in um you know yeah totally there's skulls there i don't know and the movie's not that at all you know right it's winter time so the girls are like completely completely covered from head to toe in fact it's freezing um it's snowing at one point so i think a lot of the negative reviews that we have received are because people go in with an expectation i don't know girls in a cabin getting it on um or something because that's what men expect from horror is naked women in lesbian scenes um Mm -hmm. and then they get something entirely different and yet the audience we could potentially be getting um which are people who are just looking for you know a more mainstream kind of you know film would are not watching those are like oh it's another thing about women naked in the woods or something you know yeah i had a to be honest i had initially dismissed it uh based on the artwork it wasn't until i had uh i read a review i think it was in or no no it was an interview with uh, uh pop horror mm-hmm. um uh tony or tori yeah. uh, I, forget, I forget her last name but mm-hmm. um and uh, i read an interview with you and i was like oh that actually sounds like a legit movie and then then went back and watched it oh. and yeah it's def- it's definitely not a cheap slasher movie no it's not at all it's not that at all and you know i mean i'm not there are a lot of i friends of mine are like that's my least favorite movie and that's that's fine it's not for everyone oh yeah but if you go in with a certain amount of expectation if you're just a random viewer and you're not in the film industry and you're not um a filmmaker yourself and you just see a a you know, a poster and then you go watch, you're going to be like, this is not what I, this is not what I was sold at all. And hence you get a lot of angry reviews. That's hurt us a lot in sales. I mean, we're still, especially this last year with the pandemic, we our sales are much higher than they were the year before. Um, yeah. But it's definitely affected, you know, sales quite a bit. And the same thing with three. I mean, three had amazing reviews. Everybody loved it. I think we got one bad review from, I don't know, dozens of them. Only one person mm-hmm. didn't really get it or didn't like it for whatever reason. Everybody else was like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so wonderful. But the artwork just doesn't sell mm-hmm. the film, you know? And I, and I, I brought it up to him and I said, you know, I really think this is, not good um part of it is good but if you could just leave out this other part you know um Mm -hmm. and it just you know as filmmakers we don't really get a say yeah a lot of times we do not (laughs) that's that's my only because other than that i mean he he is super honest he has a ton of contacts he he will um report you know every three months you know, like clockwork and send your stuff and, and pays and whatever, which you, you, I mean, I, I don't know about your personal experience, but that from what I hear, it's like, that's unheard of. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had my, f- my first four titles, I had bad experiences with distributors. Four. It's amazing. I still actually make movies. Yeah. I had really bad experiences. What's wrong with us that we keep trying? You and <laughs> I know they say the, you know, what is it? The sign of uh, being crazy is doing the same thing over and over <laughs> expecting a different result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i took i i think it was uh, oh man i mean i was working for other people by the time i did my fourth movie but you know i think by the time i did my next one 
oh man, it was years later before I was like learned how to make money. I learned how to work with the distributors better. I didn't know I I didn't know anything about contracts or anything. I just my first two I signed really bad contracts for. Mm. You know, and the movies made money. I just never saw any. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm very lucky to have had the life experiences that I did by, you know, first being an attorney. And then I used to like really beat myself up about that. Like, oh, why did I go to law school? That's, you know, that's, that's, so, that's so not me. I did it just because, you know, I wanted some security, but I wasted mm-hmm. all that time. But I mean, in hindsight, it really worked out for me because it, it's given me both the business and the background uh, experience just to deal with a lot of this crap. Uh, that's awesome. I, yeah, I was going to ask if, uh, if your background in business and law had, had helped, you know, through, throughout your career. Definitely. I mean, like, um, I, I just, I, well, I've had, I've had my own business since I was like 26. And mm-hmm. so a lot of the same skills that goes to running a business goes into making a film. To me, that part is very easy, you know? Uh, just even like small things like how to file the taxes for a company, how to, you know, mm-hmm. how to um, set up the company legally. Well, that probably I also learned as I'm training though, how to, I don't know, how to hire, fire, taxes, you know, employee taxes, all that kind of thing. Like all that came from having my own business and running all that and knowing, you know, how to do it in a way that you're, following the law and also that it's profitable or at least not as expensive, you know, um, because having a company, if it's not making money, it can be very costly between filing annual reports and, you know, filing taxes and all that stuff, stuff that people don't think about. I'm lucky to have had years of experience before I ever made movies to have learned those things. And then, and then my legal background can be very helpful when I had to do, you know, contracts for the films and, you know, employment contracts for the crew and cast. Um, I never had to hire an attorney for that. I can only imagine how much that stuff would, would cost. And also, you know, dealing with distributors and, and looking at distribution um, contracts that are, some of them are like 50 pages long. You know, when I when I first started uh, a lot of the contracts I did, I just pulled off the internet. I had I had no idea if they were good or not, or if it was right. I just and you probably never know because they'll never be tested in court, right? Well, let's talk about something a little more fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is all good. I like the the thing about it too is like people get worried about you know being too down on it, but you know I think people need to be aware of the realities of the film business and how tough it is. I mean, I know on my channel sometimes you know I come off a little uh, like a cheerleader for independent film. Just get out there and do it, guys. But it, it is it is very hard. The odds are against you, and there's there's just so many pitfalls. So I I, re- I appreciate the candor on it. You you started out. Um, wanting to be a, uh, well, wanting to be, you are a writer. Do you consider yourself to be a writer first? Yeah. Yeah. I do way more writing than I do anything else. So maybe producing just because, you know, as a writer, you write a script and that's it. You know, if you're making it, then you move on to producer mode. Or if you're not making it, it just sits there and you're like submitting it or whatever you're doing with it. Uh, As a producer on a film, seriously, I mean, that's, that's, three, four years of your life. I mean, you're constantly thinking about how to sell it, how to, how to first, how to raise the money for it, then how to make it, then, then how to sell it or how to complete it and then how to sell it. Um, so, so probably producing is the one that takes the most time. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one that like, if, if I had just had to do one thing, then writing would definitely be it. I mean, it's definitely the part that I enjoy the most, the part that's not stressful to me at all. Um, and that even if nobody ever read one of my scripts again, I would continue writing. Oh, that's great. And I, th- I think that's the hallmark of, uh, like any good writer. They just, they just write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't write for a long time. Um, I went to school originally for writing. I wanted to be a novelist and so I went and got an English degree and, and all my, um, uh, electos within my major were about creative writing. Um, uh, my school didn't offer a creative writing degree. 
Mm-hmm. But, you know, as I was graduating, it was like, okay, what do I do now? It's not like I can go get a, a novelist job or something. So what do I right. do? Which is how I ended up going to law school. And I convinced myself of this as I was going to law school in New York that it was the mecca for publishing. And I would have all this time to write and I would, be, you know, and somebody would discover me. So I would never actually need to use the degree. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, what did I know? It was like 21 at the time. Um, right. And so I totally gave, convinced myself of that. And um, well, that didn't really happen. I didn't really have any time to write where I was in New York because I was in law school when I was at NYU, which is one of the hardest law schools in the country. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so there was no way. Were you always attracted to horror? Yeah, man. Since I was a kid, like um, maybe not horror necessarily, but like anything that was mysterious and you know my mom used to love like the old suspense thrillers i grew up in cuba Mm -hmm. and so entertainment got cut off in 1961 like like the cars um so we used to watch like a lot of the old old you know hollywood films with um there were some kind of mystery like all the hitchcock movies pre-1961 i mean i just used to watch them with her all the time and she said that um I would always be like figuring out the mystery before she did. I don't know if that's true. I think she just makes that up. Um, <laughs> but by the time we got here to, to the U S and then uh, I remember I used to have with my cousin, we used to do um, like haunted houses in our garage for our families and Scooby-Doo was my favorite or probably the only, um, the only cartoon I ever watched have you have you written uh, screenplays for other people? I have. Um, I mean, I do all the time. Um, what What is that like? I, I I've honestly I've I, I've written a ton, but I've never I've always just kind of written for myself or it's on my shelf. I've never had someone direct something of mine. Oh, you mean like actually? Well, I've never actually had anybody direct one of my other things. They've been they've been options and stuff like that. I've never. I got you. It I got you. seems to die somewhere in development. But I do write stuff that I know I'm not going to make all all the time. Um, mm-hmm. And in the last couple of years, I've really started branching out from doing um, just thrillers and horror to other kinds of things. Kind of like flexing your muscle as a writer mm-hmm. see, and trying other genres. So I've done now, hmm, I want to say like four romantic comedies. Oh, wow. Just funny because I'm not really necessarily, I mean, I watch them, but I'm not necessarily a big fan of romantic comedies. Um, Mm -hmm. Like to me, they're pretty cheesy. (laughs) Well, that that probably makes you a good candidate to actually write one though. Maybe (laughs) imbue it with a little more, uh, I don't know, depth. Yeah. Like mine are actually comedies that are anti-romantic and anything else. (laughs) Like, um, the romance is secondary always to something else and it's more about the comedy behind it um than really the romantic part i mean i love comedies so but they're not a lot of in my opinion a lot of really good female-led comedies that aren't either very sappy or the other extreme which is like really what i would call slapstick kind of thing mm-hmm. like i'm not a fan of, of of bridesmaids i know everybody thought that was like the best thing but you know the whole everybody pooping yeah. at the same time thing like I don't yeah, know. you want something a little less broad something uh, a little more uh I, I don't know specific or grounded more real i guess mm-hmm. i mean i i think the male female relationships are just so funny because of just how different we are so I guess, I guess my scripts are more about that, about how we see things differently. Have you been staying uh, busy during uh, quarantine? I did. I actually made a movie because I didn't learn from my last, from my last five movies. I made uh, my sixth movie. Um, it's called 73 Minutes. I wanted to make a movie that used these crazy times as, an, as a way to use the rules of the of the pandemic and um, the social distancing rules to make a movie, but not about the pandemic, because I figured there would be like a thousand movies about what it's like to survive this pandemic. So I right. made a movie. So I wrote a script that it's a thriller and it has it has nothing to do with pandemic with the pandemic, but 
we followed all the rules. So we don't have any actors on the same screen at the same time. I had to come up with a story that was completely self-contained and that you could have people interact without being in the same room. So I came up with this idea of a woman who is is leaving the hotel after a sordid affair with her coworker. And uh, as she's driving home, she gets a phone call saying that she has to deliver a file to a place, um, some remote place outside of town, 73 minutes away. And so in that drive, she is calling her lover and she's calling her mother. She's calling, you know, she's getting calls from, from the, um, the guy who, who's threatening her. And she's trying to figure out what it is, what it is about this file that he wants so that she can try to see how she can get out of it because she's afraid that the moment she hands over the file, he's going to kill her. It's a, it's, it's how to keep that, happening while all you see is her in the car and every yeah. every interaction with the other characters is either via a phone call or a video call because she's also using like video call apps wow that I, honestly that sounds really good i'm i'm, I'm intrigued <laughs> so th- this has been this has been shot right yeah it was filmed already we're we're, we're about finished we just need the color um ah, wow and it's um i mean so far my new world it's all friends and family and stuff like that. But everybody mm-hmm. who watched this was like, oh my God, that was really, that was really suspenseful. Um, so if I can get away with this. Yeah. I, well, I, you definitely got one ticket sold. Um, <laughs> what were some of the, what were some of the challenges uh, shooting all in the car? Was it, was it all uh, like a real car? Did you build a. It was a real car. It was, it was a real car. I mean, this is really, like, I wrote it um, over two days uh, back in May. And by- you wrote the you wrote the script in two days. Mm-hmm. Just me. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. great. Once I know what I want, it's very easy for me to write. Um, That's great. And so by Friday afternoon, I had sent any um, a message to certain people that I know have worked with me before. Like I have always paid everybody, mm-hmm. um, but this time I felt like okay, I don't have time to go get money. You know, so I'm not gonna. I'm not. It's not realistic for me to do that. Yeah. So who can I reach that will has worked with me before enough that they will be saying, Hey, listen, I'm well, this is, I know how you work. I know you're very professional. I know that you're, that you, no matter what happens, you're going to kill yourself to try to make this money and to get this the most exposure possible. And it's not just going to end up on a shelf somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that that goes to building reputation as a person, an honest person, and a yeah, absolutely, hardworking person. Absolutely. So I um, reached out to them and I said, okay, look, I, I, I'm not going to have time to, to if we're going to do this. The selling point is going to be that we did this during the pandemic, you know, and during this lockdown, and nobody ever thought that this would go on this far, right? It was May. It was like, oh, let's just be over in a month. We got to shoot this like right now. <laughs> so, so. Um, so I reached out to them. I was like, we need to shoot this like right away. So we had like two weeks to prepare mm-hmm. and we shot it um, in Miami where I, my family is and I have mm-hmm. where I started. So I have a lot of, you know, contacts there. We shot it there. Um, part of it, she's driving herself. Um, not a lot because oh, some of it she's pulled over. So it didn't matter. But mm-hmm. um the part where she's actually driving and we were recording where it was very tiny. The rest of it, we were actually touring the car. Um, and so um, we were able to just put cameras inside the car. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and we, did you pretty much just plant them? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. They were planted. Um, we did a ton of, of B roll um, before and after like, um, over the head, you know, over the, over the shoulder shots and stuff like that right. could insert throughout. Um, but for the most part, or, or the, the meat of the movie is two different angles because it's either the camera that was right in front of her or the camera that was mm-hmm. to her side. Um, gotcha. so, and then the other calls, the, the video calls, um, the actors were all over the place. They're, you know, they were in Georgia, Tennessee, um texas and another person in florida 
And so they just recorded themselves and that's interwoven, you know, since it's supposed to be a video call anyway, it's not, it can't be like really high quality anyway. Right. Um, so they, you pretty much had them self tape those. Yeah. 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 Um, I did go up to Tennessee. Um, I was living in Georgia at the time, so I was kind of equidistant to, to both. Um, mm-hmm. So I did go up to Tennessee and recorded like just, I think it's once it, it works out to like two scenes um, with the guy who plays the the bad guy. Nice. I thought that sounds really good and, re- and really, really smart the way you structured the shoot. You know, I, I, I mean, that's, I think, I think as a filmmaker, that's all you can do, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, my hope is not, I mean, I love making movies and I love, I love the whole filmmaking experience, but it's not something you can do long-term. I mean, you, you eventually have to be able to make money off of this. Um, oh, yeah. So my hope with this, as it is with every other project is that I'm building a resume so that somebody be like, you know, that's what she can do in that kind of a budget. What can she do with a real budget with, you know, with bigger names, with, you know, with a bigger crew, it's still, it's still hard. I mean, it's still a crapshoot. So I noticed on IMDb that uh, you had a documentary uh, film in the works. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Goodwill Ambassador. And uh, I mean, I love to travel. That's like probably more than writing or anything else in the world, anything else that I like. Um, that's like my number one passion. Um, and so I want to say it was 2017. I went on a trip to Thailand and it was um, with a group where we were um, doing um, volunteer work and also being tourists. And I thought that was just the coolest idea of everything because it was like um, you could give back to these communities that you're visiting. And so I thought, you know, there's this, this is, there's a story in here somehow. And especially we spent a lot of time with um, the elephants in Thailand and um are you know trying to educate people not to ride the elephants because that's like a big tourist attraction people go there they ride their elephants or whatever but it's actually um not only physically bad for the animals but the way they train them to do that is just completely inhumane i mean Mm -hmm. it is their they go through uh, a breaking in period where they literally just torture these animals to get them to do that. That's not a natural thing for an elephant to do. They don't want people on top of them. Um, and so they're taken, they're usually taken as, as babies from their mothers, um, taken across the borders illegally and, you know, and basically tortured until they're docile enough to be able to allow people to write them. Um, mm. And it's just, it's heartbreaking to watch the videos of the torture. But, you know, there's quite a bit of that, you know, in the, out there already. Um, so I didn't want to make a documentary about that. There's quite a few out there and, you know, PETA has a bunch of, you know, videos that you can search and you, if, if you get it, want to get educated about that. Rather, I wanted to do a multi-year, multi um destination um story about encouraging people to travel and then give back to the communities that they go to so um so like let this year or sorry this past year in 2020 i went to costa rica i volunteered i had an animal habitat there um where did i go before that in 2000 i already lost dates 2019 um, I went to Fiji, volunteered at Habitat there. Seems like every, 2000, yeah, 2018. I, it, I've been doing it, you know, little by little. So like every year I just mm-hmm. take another trip of 2021. Uh, I was supposed to be in Tanzania doing that and climbing mm. um, Mount Kilimanjaro. But because of COVID, I didn't want to go and infect a bunch of people and, you know, kill an entire village or something. So... Um, yeah. So that's postponed until whatever I get the vaccine or whatever happens. So I just have uh, one more question. I kind of ask everybody this as a c- total hypothetical. Um, if I were to show up on your doorstep with uh, $50,000 uh, to make a small independent feature, um, what kind of feature would you make and how 
like broadly, generally, would you spread out that budget? God, I'm fifty thousand dollars. It's all gonna go to make the movies. It's not gonna go. I mean, marketing. Um, by the way, if you're gonna do marketing, you want to do somebody that's indie friendly and is amazing. Uh, October Coast is, you know, amazing. I have been hearing a lot about them. I, I actually, I have, I had a call scheduled with them last week that I had to miss. So I'm going to try to talk to them this week. Oh, do it. I mean, they're so good. They're so good. And they're, you know, they work within the uh, producers and they're, and they're very affordable. I mean, super, super affordable. Like you, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to give quotes cause I don't know if. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll talk to them. I, I've, I've heard a couple, I've heard a few figures, but uh, we'll, we'll yeah. definitely so see. Let, let's put, let's just put $2,000 towards marketing. Um, okay. So it gives me $48,000. I mean, I would definitely have a single location shoot minimum characters with 50, with $48,000. Uh, that depends on the location, I guess. Um, if I can find, if I can have a location that's free, then that gives me more money. But I mean, that pretty much is, is going to go pay to make the film itself. I mean, it's including yeah. posts, yeah. Post, I, you know, at this point I've developed contacts where I can get posts done pretty cheap. So let's say the other $8,000 towards posts and then the 40 okay. towards the actual film itself right. and you would you would stay in horror horror is just not selling right now i mean i won't i won't show record it for anybody there's just too much of it there have been people just constantly telling people oh you want to make a, a successful film that's going to make a lot of money and um and you know you don't need name talent blah blah, blah do horror and so mm-hmm. people who have no desire or interest in doing horror are making horror films just so that again yeah. sell it as a result, usually bad horror films. <laughs> so many. And yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, our mm-hmm. are blown house, you know, um, value or anything like that, but, but at least they're legitimate horror films. Yes. Um, and people who, I mean, I've had people who are like, Oh, I'm making a horror film. I mean, I don't really like horror, but you know, it's the only thing I can make with the money I have. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, from those of us who actually do love the genre, <laughs> f- you. So, um, so as a, as a result, there's just so many that I, you know, at the point when I was originally selling Hazmat, All Girls Weekend, and and um, Agorafoy at the same time, mind you, we had Tony Todd, and so we had mm, a cast for for agoraphobia and they were all all the offers we were getting were the same regardless of he was in there or not wow so how you know even having a name talent with you know with a following yeah. didn't really help so and it's because there's just so much of it right. i mean yeah like the the audience is there but literally you know you can go into amazon or wherever um tubi which pays a lot tubi. better so everybody watched tubi instead of of Amazon, please. Um, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and you can, I don't know, you can just put vampire, witch, you know, or whatever, and you're going to get like hundreds of titles and how do you choose? So mm-hmm. because of that, they're not paying us anything. Mm-hmm. So don't do horror. Um, I would probably, I'll try, I'd try to do a sci-fi film. There's a, there's a, hmm a real need there's not a lot of sci-fi that's true and especially on a budget Mm -hmm. the only problem is you know you'd have to write a a budget that you can shoot a sci-fi film for forty thousand dollars, something like ex machina or something like that you know right yeah yeah where it's very very contained and it's just two people or yeah three people i guess well lou thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me no thanks for having me it was so much fun i love talking about movies and movie making i had i had to lose your money all your money <laughs> if you're liking my stuff don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button and let me know your dog's name in the comments or if you don't have a dog what would your dog's name be but whatever you do keep making movies